Welcome to Outpatient Physical Therapy Considerations for Post-Acute COVID-19, Part 3, Post-Acute Care Issues. This is part of the Post-Acute COVID-19 Exercise and Rehabilitation Project, or PACER. As a brief review from Part 1, Pathophysiology, the clinical course of COVID-19 will range from non-severe to critical disease. As you recall, non-severe disease tends to occur in about 80% of patients who contract COVID-19 and consists of supportive care only. They may have fever, cough, myalgia, headaches, stable shortness of breath or dyspnea, and an oxygen saturation at least 90%. It's low acuity, they don't necessarily have any falls, hypotension, lethargy, confusion, or cyanosis. And the therapy for this is to treat the symptoms, prevent infection transmission, and isolate as needed. Some of these patients may require supplemental oxygen, but it can be done at home. For severe critical disease, many of these patients are hospitalized. They show hypoxia or low oxygen levels in the body, high acuity, likely ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome, and other complications. Many of these patients are also referred to a clinical trial of experimental medication. We'll do a brief review of investigational therapies for COVID-19 since many patients presenting to the outpatient setting later on after they've recovered from COVID-19 may have been on some of these medications while hospitalized. One is remdesivir, which is a nucleotide analog with activity against the SARS coronavirus 2 in vitro. In a NIAID study, which is the National Institutes of Allergic and Infectious Disease, it showed faster time to recovery, either discharged from the hospital or no longer requiring supplemental oxygen, with a median of 11 versus 15 days with placebo. There were non-significant trends towards lower mortality. The side effect with this is that it may cause liver enzyme elevation, but at this point it has been largely used in multiple trials. Hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine has been controversial. There is insufficient data and its use is only recommended as part of a clinical trial or emergency use. And in fact, just recently, the World Health Organization stopped a recent clinical trial of hydroxychloroquine because it was causing more harm than good. The reason for the problems with hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine is that it might prolong the QT interval on a patient's EKG. That interval on the EKG is susceptible to creating ventricular tachycardia if it is stimulated in the right way. So any patients who are known to have prolonged QT intervals or if they're on other medications that might affect cardiac conduction or also prolong the QT interval, hydroxychloroquine should not be used with these patients or if it's needed to be used, it should be done only with close monitoring. Hydroxychloroquine has been combined with azithromycin in the past, but that is no longer in practice due to the additive effect on QT prolongation because azithromycin is an antibiotic that will also prolong that QT interval. Some other investigational therapies include convalescent plasma, which is plasma from donors who are completely recovered from the COVID-19 virus and have been for the past two to three weeks. This plasma contains COVID-19 antibodies that will fight against the active COVID-19 in patients who have recently contracted the disease and are sick with it. Hyperimmune globulin, or hyper-IG, is manufactured or derived from convalescent plasma. It's similar to IVIG, which is intravenous immunoglobulin, but it contains high titers of the antibody against a specific antigen, namely the COVID-19 virus, compared with a standard preparation of IVIG, so it's a more concentrated form. Interleukin-6 blockers, or IL-6 blockers, include tocilizumab, or Actemra, which has been used in several clinical trials. And this Actemra is typically used for rheumatoid diseases and um, also for cytokine release syndrome. And it's thought that the interleukin-6 chemical is responsible or at least partly responsible for the inflammatory response within the system during COVID-19. Its use is published in case reports only for the coronavirus and also under investigation are similar drugs called cerilumab and siltuximab. 
Favipiravir is an RNA polymerase inhibitor that directly inhibits the virus, and it's being evaluated in clinical trials. Lopinavir ritonavir is a protease inhibitor that is primarily and historically used for HIV infection, but has also shown some in vitro activity against the original SARS-CoV virus, and has shown some activity also against the MERS-CoV in animal studies. However, recent randomized controlled trials looking at the drug against the coronavirus or the COVID-19 has shown no clear benefit and in fact has had some adverse side effects. And of course, there are vaccines under investigation, but nothing has been confirmed as yet. Before moving on, a brief review of critical care issues that a minority of patients with COVID-19 may have faced. Patients who became critically ill with COVID-19, again, the small minority, may have developed ARDS as a result of COVID-19 effects on their lungs. ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, may have resulted in mechanical ventilation, proning, a lot of ICU care, and a lot of ICU medications, causing impairments down the road. They may have had sepsis, inflammation, kidney injury, liver injury, cardiac injury, and hypercoagulopathy, or any combination of these. We also want to look for neurologic issues as well, as many patients may have developed this. This diagram provides an excellent illustration of the systemic effects of critical illness. In the center, we've got the critical illness from COVID with the systemic inflammatory response. Going up from there, we see the cardiovascular changes with heart rate, blood pressure, edema, Moving clockwise, we see changes in cognition, communication, we see anxiety and depression, possibly post-traumatic stress disorder, neuromuscular changes in muscle function and postural control and balance, metabolic changes, including glucose control issues that may be especially important in patients who have diabetes. We see GI and GU changes. Integumentary, we see skin breakdown and wounds potentially from the prolonged bed rest musculoskeletally, severe weakness, loss of lean body mass, increased fat deposits, decreased bone mineral density, and pulmonary, of course, we see prolonged impaired ventilation, increased respiratory rate, and ongoing shortness of breath, potentially even after the patient recovers from COVID. Patients who have had a prolonged ICU stay for ARDS related to COVID-19 will hopefully be discharged to a short-term rehab facility or home with PT services. But the impairments that they have from the ICU can last for months or even years. Many patients, even when they're done with the short-term rehab or the home PT, will be referred to outpatient physical therapy or even seek it out themselves. One common consequence of the ICU stay is post-intensive care syndrome, also called PICS. This is defined as a new or worsening cognitive, psychiatric, and or physical function after critical illness. And it affects over 50% of ICU survivors. One aspect, the cognitive aspect, affects 30 to 80% of patients who have PICS. And with the cognitive part, we can see changes in patients that may appear similar to them having had a moderate TBI, traumatic brain injury, or even mild dementia. We may see impaired attention, concentration, memory, mental processing, and executive function. For psychiatric diagnoses, which affect 8 to 57% of patients with PICS, we may see depression, shown as fatigue, loss of interest, poor appetite, sense of hopelessness, and insomnia, anxiety, shown as excessive worry, irritability, restlessness, or fatigue, and post-traumatic stress disorder, shown as effective or behavioral responses to stimuli that provoke flashbacks, hyperarousal, severe anxiety, avoidance of experiences that evoke symptoms, or sexual dysfunction. In the physical category, which is 25 to 85% of patients with PICS, we see ICU-acquired weakness or generalized weakness, poor mobility, and multiple falls. So it's important to be able to identify these three categories of a patient that may present to outpatient physical therapy with PICS. There are several diagnostic tests for assessing severity of PICS in patients after an ICU stay. These tests may have been done in the hospital setting or during an outpatient follow-up appointment with a primary care doctor or a specialist. 
on presentation to outpatient physical therapy, some of these tests may be available in the patient's medical record for review. The tests for cognition include Montreal Cognitive Assessment, or the MOCA, the Modified Mini Mental State Exam, the MMSE, and the MINICOG. Psychiatric includes Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale, the Beck Depression Inventory, the Beck Anxiety Inventory, and the Post Traumatic Stress Syndrome 10 Questions Inventory, which is the PTSS 10. And physically, there is a formal PT and OT assessment. Studies in post-intensive care syndrome outcomes show that improvements can occur over 6 to 12 months after the ICU stay. However, cognitive, psychiatric, or physical impairments might persist for several years. Physical function is the most likely deficit to improve in the initial 12 months, making referral to outpatient physical therapy all the more important. These patients with PICS show a lower health-related quality of life and even a possible inability to return to work. This occurs in over 30% of patients with PICS. In those that can return to work, many of them have to reduce their hours or may have to work a different type of job. These patients with PICS have an increased risk of rehospitalization as well and an increased mortality risk, especially within the first three to six months post ICU stay. The highest risk is among patients who had sepsis, mechanical ventilation, neuromuscular weakness, or renal failure, or were discharged to a skilled nursing facility or long-term acute care facility. ICU-acquired weakness is a diagnosis in the physical category of PICS. It includes critical illness polyneuropathy, critical illness myopathy, and the combined critical illness polyneuromyopathy. In as little as four to seven days in the ICU, a patient may develop any of these. Critical illness polyneuropathy is thought due to axonal degeneration that could occur in the setting of the inflammatory response and can manifest as weakness, reduced deep tendon reflexes, and impaired pain, temperature, and vibratory sense. Cranial nerves are typically spared and facial weakness is common. Critical illness myopathy tends to affect the limb and respiratory muscles. And this atrophy is due to the catabolic or muscle breakdown state that occurs during acute illness. Patients can have an over 10% loss in muscle mass just within the first week of being in the ICU. Many patients who have the ICU acquired weakness have some combination of the polyneuropathy and myopathy. Risk factors that may make a patient more prone to developing ICU acquired weakness are sepsis and inflammation, multiple organ failure, a longer duration on mechanical ventilation or a longer ICU stay, high lactate levels, hyperglycemia or poor blood glucose control in the ICU, premorbid frailty or disability, and certain medications such as vasoactive medications used to increase blood pressure during sepsis, neuromuscular blocking agents, corticosteroids, sedatives, and certain antibiotics. The diagnosis of ICU-acquired weakness is made via abnormal nerve conduction studies or a Medical Research Council sum score of less than 48 out of a possible 60 points. The MRC sum score adds up the results of 12 manual muscle tests of 12 different muscle groups, six bilaterally. They are scored from 0 to 5, as you can see in the bottom right corner. When all 12 muscle groups are scored, they are summed up, and if the score total score is less than 48, then a diagnosis of ICU-acquired weakness can be made. Research has also been done assessing handheld dynamometry or looking at quad force for testing for ICU-acquired weakness, but these tests have not yet been validated. Some strategies to minimize the risk of ICU-acquired weakness include interruption of sedative medications, avoidance of hyperglycemia, avoidance of early parenteral nutrition, which has had harmful effects within the first week of an ICU stay, and early mobility and physical therapy. This concludes part three, post-acute care issues in outpatient physical therapy considerations for post-acute COVID-19. Here are some references. And here are some additional links for further reading and information on post-acute care COVID-19. Please join me in the next segment, which is part four, discussing outpatient evaluation and treatment in patients who are post-acute COVID-19.